Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Hypothesis Podcast. We are here on episode six, and my name is Feely. I'm Patrick. And I'm Liam. And today we're gonna be discussing in the main topic about dark matter and part of Patrick's past research. But to start with, let's go on about something interesting that we have found or experienced this past week. I've made a discovery. Oh. I discovered something that someone else discovered. Um, so, so there's this thing um, that black holes, that realistic black holes have called an ergosphere. And I've heard a lot about it. Um, I go to all these conferences and on YouTube, and it's always brought up and how you can create kind of like a black hole engine out of them. What does that even mean? So today I finally decided to look into it. So when, so, so Einstein came up with his theory of general relativity way back in the day. And I don't know if he was the first person, but I think he was the first person to solve his equations was a uh, short shield. Um, and he came up with the short shield metric, which basically describes, describes how things move around a spherically symmetric non-rotating black hole with no charge. Um, so just basically something that's not spinning and it has a mass. So if you want to build on top of this, um, you can look at look and see black holes in our universe. You, we've detected gravitational waves. That's one way we've seen them. We have these kind of orange blob photos of them, um, <clears throat> which maybe we should talk about in the future, actually. That'd be a good topic. Cause there's a whole documentary on uh, documentary on Netflix that goes into those images, which is kind of cool. Um, and you can also see the effect of black holes in space through kind of what things that move around them. You can't actually see them because they're black. They they absorb light. They don't emit it. Um, not currently, at least. But oh yeah. Well, I just retrace back of it. You mentioned Schwarzschild, shield, right? But a lot of Einstein. Um... Um, theory and stuff, you see a lot of names that are not Einstein's, like the one that's very important is Lawrence, right? Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, the, like Lawrence Factor, because um, um, it's actually in almost all the special relativity stuff. And yeah. why is it not Einstein Factor? Because Lawrence, back in the days, he was an um, uh, astronomer, basically. He kept records of very meticulous and, uh, and very well-kept records. And what happens is that he f found out this, this basically the, like the time rate, uh, time dilation ratio, or like this discrepancy then from classical mechanics. So he write write it down. He has he basically solved it out. It's like, well, there's this this factor. He doesn't know why. And Einstein came along. It's like, well, he has the theory behind it. But in the spirit of the first who discovered it, Lawrence got the name for the thing yeah i i don't think we've talked about it yet but we should maybe talk about that kind of thought experiment that einstein came up with as to where all this stuff comes from you know the the kind of mirror in the train and things bouncing back and forth we should definitely talk about that at some point if we haven't i don't think we have but anyway so black holes they were predicted and then later in time we saw them essentially However, the short shield black hole is like kind of the kind of the spherical cow of black holes. And for people who don't know, physicists like to make things simple. So if something is close enough to a sphere, we just call it a sphere. So it's a joke that physicists will assume a cow is a sphere because it will make your calculations easier. Um, so there's a black hole called a Kerr black hole. And basically it's uh, non-spherically symmetric and it's rotating. It still has zero charge. Because the idea is that if a black hole accumulates charge, um, if it's positive charge, then it's negative charge, things will get kind of pulled into it and positive ones will go away. And after a long time, it will kind of have a net zero charge. And that's another thing I should point out is that all this stuff gets sucked into a black hole. But there's this thing called the no hair theorem, which means you can characterize a black hole by kind of three quantities its mass, its charge, and it's spin, so it's angular momentum. And it's called no hair, I think, because, you know, um, 
if nobody has hair, it'd be harder to tell people. It'd be harder to distinguish people apart. So I think that's kind of the idea behind the name. So anyway, this Kerr black hole is that it's a rotating black hole, and what ends up happening is that similar to a gravi- similar to a regular Schwarzschild black hole, um, where the inside so so a Schwarzschild black hole you can think of as kind of the warping of space time, such that space time kind of flows faster than the speed of light itself, and that's fine because space time is allowed to move faster than the speed of light. So inside the black hole, this kind of this this fabric of space time is being pulled downwards faster than light can escape and that's kind of what creates the event horizon where everything past it gets pulled in and doesn't escape for a Kerr black hole it does this thing called frame drag which basically means as it rotates the space time around the black hole actually moves faster than the speed of light you get this kind of donutty pumpkin shaped region around the black hole that moves fat uh, where light can't even light can't escape from it sometimes that part's not really clear to me. I haven't really looked into it too much, but it's interesting because you can create kind of you can you can generate energy or you can do work with this ergosphere. So the idea is that you fire in some kind of say like a rock or something into the ergosphere. And what happens is that it orbits the black hole and it accelerates as it does so. And then what happens is that you split this rock in two somehow you put like a little bomb on it or something and it breaks into two pieces so one piece will get pulled into the black hole and the other piece will fire out of the ergosphere and escape and what ends up happening is that this escaping rock actually is 20 percent more energy than you put into it so it well maybe not 20 percent, but it can have can have up to 20 percent more kinetic energy than you put into it so just as a another visualization this was done in a movie i believe it came out in 2014 called Interstellar. Uh, Now, in Interstellar, it's about traveling to another planetary system that's orbiting a black hole, and towards the end of of the movie, spoiler alert, the main actor, Matthew McConaughey, jettisons himself into a black hole, letting the other person escape, and this is actually using that same principle, where they're part of the same spaceship, and then he takes one spaceship and dumps off into a black hole, which ends up not being a black hole kind of thing, and then the other person is free to escape the black hole's escape velocity. Uh, again, outside the event horizon, so it's a bit easier. And that that's a good principle to see. Yeah, exactly. And I don't, I don't fully understand it because I just watched a YouTube video on it earlier today by PBS Space Time, which is probably one of my favorite physics YouTube channels of all time. I just love the way they do things, but so I'm I'm obviously no expert, even though I kind of study black holes, but I've never really looked into Kerr black holes before. But yeah, so ideally you don't want to fire rocks into a black hole or near a black hole to gain energy. So instead of shooting a rock in and getting kind of 20% more kinetic energy as it comes out, you can do the same thing with light. And I forget the exact details of it, but you can fire kind of photons in they'll orbit the black hole in such a way that they kind of gain some energy and then they fire back out and you can, you know, maybe have a solar panel or something outside to collect their energy. So it's the idea of kind of a black hole engine because black holes have a, they're they're these pretty, pretty scary, powerful objects in the universe. So if you can create a way to kind of harness their energy, you could get a lot of it out of there for, well, not for free, but. Yeah. Speaking about that free part, if you've ever heard of gravitational assists where rockets especially or spacecraft can use the movement of planets in their orbit around the sun to essentially gain energy this is a similar principle but the interesting thing is that for every say object or or rock that you split in half part of it goes in part of it goes out uh it actually has an effect on the black hole itself because as liam said you don't get energy for free Mm-hmm. And so in this case, if you were to do this enough, then the black hole would stop spinning or, or start to slow down at least. Yeah, that's, that's one thing I also failed to mention is that kind of the total angular momentum and charge and mass of a black hole is kind of the sum-ish of all of its constituent bits and pieces that it's swallowed in its lifetime. So, so if you have a bunch of little particles spinning as they get sucked in, its total angular momentum will be the sum of those because angular momentum's conserved. Um, 
Yeah, so I think that's I I, I really like all that sci-fi stuff. I think the idea was the original idea of this black hole engine was by uh, Roger Penrose, um, wicked physicist. I I saw a lecture by him during COVID, so it was on Zoom, unfortunately, but he's a pretty famous guy. Yeah, well, just to steer we are away from the space stuff. I think this one thing I learned this past week, not really learned. But I was looking at、um, different TV technology for some reason, and I found this QLED. You know, we have heard of LED, we have heard of LCD, we have heard of OLED, and but the new one I've heard is QLED, which is a quantum dot LED. And I was like, "What is a quantum dot?" That sounds ridiculous because when I think about quantum, it's like, "Well, that's not in um." In not in that temperature scale of room temperature, I think of dot as a mathematical dot has no size. Like it makes no sense, but to be in something that have like huge wide range application. But when I look into it, they actually means very differently. <laughs> the quantum dot is actually a doped a doped semiconductor. So it's basically just make a LED in a special way such that. Well, they trap like an exciton inside a semiconductor, such that it basically turns that part into a, like a two-level system, so it can have pretty pretty pure、um, light coming out. Well, I have to explain a bit of the exciton. It's a quasi particle, so it's not really a, it's not a real particle. It's something that basically we we made we made up. It's like well, this is a particle now, but it's basically Electrons bounded,、uh, bounded to the lack of electron. <laughs> Sounds weird, but people who ever studied solid state physics heard of holes before. When、um, material has、uh, quote unquote holes, it means that it is doped in some way that the electron is missing that part. And exciton is the bound state between that electron and that hole. And if you can trap that in in certain Um, geometry. They just call that a quantum dot. I might understand it incorrectly, but that's that's the way to basically make LEDs more accurate. I think. One one thing I one thing I think quasi particles are really neat because that's that's what I study. So so quasi particles, I think, are more correctly kind of described as the um, it's it's basically a collection of particles behaving like a single particle. So so. You you think of sound as a wave, but you can also have particles of sound called phonons, and it's it's a bunch of you kind of molecules or particles or whatever behaving as kind of a wave packet itself. So a single particle of sound. I mean that's what I study in my analog black holes. So quasi particles are really cool. They appear everywhere, like you were just saying.、Um, yeah. So I'm curious about these quantum dots. So, is it? The same thing as an LED, just where a, a light emitting diode, where you have some sort of semiconducting material that's emitting light. I, what what specifically makes them different than an LED? Yeah, I think well, it is an LED. It is a subset of an LED because it's called QLED, right? It's quantum dot LED. But I think the the main difference. I don't know that much about it, but I think it's. Is how they make the diode, right? Because normally you pick a certain semiconductor that's doped in some such a way that、um, the band gap or the difference between energy would produce certain wavelengths of light. However, when you do it with quantum dot, you basically dope it with the the excitons. You trap the excitons in the semiconductors in such a way that you can control the the energy, the band gap, basically. And I think that should be how it works. Not quite sure because, like, it's it sounds like a hassle to trap ex excitons. Maybe that's why they're so expensive. I, I don't think quantum dots have to be LEDs, right? Because quantum dots are they're just these collect they're they're a collection of atoms of some kind. So you you know individual. Well, well, we were talking about QLED, so that's why I, I was talking about that. But yeah, that because quantum dots can be、um, made in lab, right? But the TVs you can see right now that are commercial, like they have 
quantum dots LED. Like, and those people usually when it comes from research level to real life application, usually it takes years. And I thought quantum dots were pretty recent. Maybe it has been around for a long time, but I'm surprised they are able to make literally like if it's 4K TV, that's like four or five million of those dots in one screen reliably. So I'm just quickly looking up quantum dot displays. And so they actually work in a somewhat similar way to uh, LCD displays or like, like crystal displays. So what they do is the quantum dots of light aren't electrified themselves, but they use blue LEDs to excite these quantum dots. And then from that excitation, and depending on the configuration of the dot itself, it will generate a different color. And so they're much more efficient than regular LEDs because, one, you can just use blue LEDs to power them, essentially, and they produce a very specific wavelength of light, and that's what they're best known for, and you don't need to filter out any excess wavelength. Yeah, so how was say like the, the, it's basically it's a way to dope the semiconductor such that it turned out to be some kind of two-level system that you can control. Yeah, it, it makes sense though. It needs some kind of backlight like an LCD, right? Um, yeah, the, the L, LED screen is uh, the light by itself, but I don't think the LED lights are very monochromatic, right? Like it's not very pure, but if you do from a quantum dot, they're very pure. But I'll be curious of how reliable in terms of colors they are, because that's more to visual aesthetics than just accurate colors or or like how that mix or what's the direction like what's the directionality of the, the QLED? Like I think uh, the industry standard. I think now they lo- they lo- everybody love OLED, but I think in the high end um, graphic screen they still use LCD, right? Yeah, yeah, or like the yeah, the XDR, which I don't know how it works. <laughs> All right, so that's the introductory part. We discuss the weekly thing. Well, now we get to the the meaty part of our discussion. So today we're going to talk about dark matter and and some research that has been done by humans, basically to try to understand and buy, basically search for this dark matter. Well, I'll start on a little bit of what I think dark matter is to me. There are predictions. <laughs> there are predictions in the model, even though we have some evidence. But since we can't really detect it, detect it the word dark, I, which I believe comes from the fact that we cannot see it. It's not visual. It doesn't interact with electromagnetic. It doesn't do interact much in weak or strong, maybe weak, weakly a little bit. Or I think they might have some gravity because, well, that's why we postulate that they have it takes a lot of mass in universe and whatnot but we couldn't find it and there's a lot of collaboration and research project searching for the these dark matter and dark energy however they may be the the artifact or the error of wrong wrongly predicted models who knows maybe we, we can figure out in 10 20 years what do you guys think so so where did dark matter come from? What what model was there that wasn't working where they said, they did the physicist thing where they said, we have one plus one equals three. Obviously that's not right. So we have to add this hypothetical dark number, one plus one plus a dark one to equal three. Very common thing in physics to say, well, our theory doesn't match our experiment. Let's pretend something exists and we'll figure it out later. So, so what was this situation? Well... As someone who spent a couple of years researching dark matter, uh, this is, I guess, another side of the research that I've done. Not the forest stuff, but before that, for my master's degree, I studied some dark matter uh, detectors specifically, so the experimental side of dark matter. But there's actually a lot of evidence for dark matter and how we know it exists. You'll hear about this later, but we first noticed we as general science and population. Uh, We first noticed dark matter 
or, or the existence of some extra mass that we couldn't see by observing the stars. So dark matter doesn't originate in a laboratory way underground. It originates from looking at the stars and seeing and observing their motion and noticing that there were defects in their motion that the amount of light reaching us couldn't explain. To expand on that a bit more, we are able to see things in the sky because they produce light. And so based on the amount of light and how far something is away, we can tell the mass of the object because if we can see it, it's producing light. And there are some relationships between the mass of an object and the amount of light it produces based on its distance. And so if we look at many, many objects and see how they behave around each other, such as a galaxy, we can say, okay, we know generally what the mass of a galaxy is. So that means we know how it should move based on Newton's equation. Uh, so going back many hundreds of years, Newton said, okay, this is how celestial bodies move. And for the most part, he was absolutely correct. However, when you look at very large scale objects like galaxies, we see that Newton didn't quite get it right. And because of that, we can't account for the exact motion of galaxies as they rotate around their center by just the visible mass. So for over 100 years now, it's been proposed that there's some, some sort of dark body in there. And it was first proposed to be dark planets or dark stars or dim stars. But we, we're, we're starting to learn a bit differently. I don't even think it's just Newton's laws. I don't think even the more correct theory of general relativity, it's, it's missing something that predicts kind of how these things spin and orbit and whatever. So that's, yeah, that's where dark matter came in, I think. Well, it's not just Newton, like Kepler's also did a very good um, theory on how, how celestial bodies move. Yeah, I, I, I can see that where dark matter is proposed, but I, if I remember correctly, there's also evidence from the, when they try to figure out the accelerating expansion of the universe and, and it wouldn't be that fast or something unless they account for dark matter and dark energy. Well, that's part I'm not quite sure of. Because it's like that the, exp the universe is expanding faster and faster every, like, as times go on. It just sounds ridiculous. So the expansion of the universe, that's theorized more so to do with dark energy, which we just don't know anything about. It's kind of scary how little we actually know about it. But that's the hypothesis, is that it's kind of this anti-gravity thing that's pushing the universe out and the amount of mass in the universe just is not nearly anywhere near enough to actually shrink it back down again yeah it's it's something i don't know the exact percents but isn't it like around five percent of all the stuff in the universe that we see or sorry everything in the universe we see because we see things through light and gravity and whatnot only about five percent of that makes up the total energy of our universe or maybe it's like three percent or something but it's like you just think of how massive the universe is and how massive these galaxies are and planets and a bajillion million suns. And that's only 5% of the stuff that accounts for all the energy. Yeah, so those numbers, it's 5% of visible matter. So anything you can see, touch, hear, interact with, 5% of the universe is made up of that. 27% of the universe, or around there, is made up of dark matter from these calculations of looking at stars and everything and then the other 68 percent is dark energy again no idea what most of the universe is made out of but those numbers it's very interesting where they come from and again they come from astronomy by observing something called the microwave background or the cosmic microwave background there are slight fluctuations within the temperature of that background and based on how the temperatures of those little fluctuations we actually see evidence for dark matter from the very beginning of the universe when that cosmic microwave background was first created. Well, one other thing about dark matter and dark energy is about my, my pet peeve-ish, that's something I want to see, but also really don't want to see. It's that ether theory coming back. Because it's like, well, if it's dark, there's dark matter and dark energy everywhere, 
That sounds like ether. And for those who are not familiar with ether theory, it's、uh, an older theory that all the space, the vacuum, is doesn't exist. That it there's something that's like a medium. Because you think about sound, sound has to travel through a medium. So why, why, why not light? Lights also have to pass through some kind of medium. They call it ether. And you know the the, the all the planets, all the stars have to move through ether. And they kind of got disproved in that ether theory that some some kind of fluids and it doesn't work that way. But if they repostulate that ether is like oh only interacting weakly and through like little gravitational, well, I don't want to see that word coming back. But that's why I kind of like they coined it as dark matter and dark energy instead of that. Yeah, you gotta be gotta be careful throwing the ether word around. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely not something that's brought up often in dark matter physics, mainly because the ether was proposed as the carrier for light. So it's a、uh, yeah, it's 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 a shun word. Yeah, one thing I kind of want to ask is um, do dark matter and dark energy dampen light? Do they kind of you know dissipate energy from light in any way? Because You know, light can travel very far. Like, like, um, well, what you said before about we measure、uh, mass of stars through light. So, are you saying that dark matter and dark energy create this di- discrepancy in what we predict the mass of the star is to what we observe? So, not quite. So far, again, dark energy. I'm just gonna throw that completely out because. There's very little known about it. We don't know what it's composed of, what it could possibly be.、Uh, from what I've seen, from my look into dark matter. Now, dark matter, as you mentioned earlier, is called that because it doesn't interact with light, or or interacts very very weakly. So overall, it doesn't have an effect on light. What we're seeing instead is, for example, if we're looking at a very far away star. And we can tell its mass quite accurately, and but that's not the issue. Is we're we're getting the mass of everything we can see correct, as correct as we can for how far away it is. The issue instead is that, based on these large scale objects like galaxies, based on the mass that we can see, there is just mass that we can't see, and so this is where dark matter comes in. It's It's not affecting the light, at, at least in the sense where it's absorbing the light and giving us the wrong idea about the mass of light emitting objects. Instead, it's just mass that we can't see. the The interesting thing, though, is that dark matter can interact with light through gravity, and so it can actually bend light. Yeah, I just want to point out for those some are not familiar with the term because we say about. A lot of like interact weakly. I don't we. I don't mean that it's interact like at in terms of magnitude weakly. I'm I I'm saying it's through weak interaction. So there are four interactions in nature. There's strong, which is um usually found in nucleus, weak, which is usually found to more like a um well more fundamental particle interactions. And you have the electromagnetic, which is you know electric. And magnetism, and the last one is gravity. So that's full of force. So weak interactions are hard to find, hard to detect because, well, as the name says, it's weak. That's why we have to build these crazy detectors to do、um, the weak interactions、uh, measurement. Yeah, and so with dark matter, we do know that it interacts at least through most likely weak. Interactions or through gravity, we have evidence that does interact through gravity, and we're waiting to detect it through weak interactions. So again, using this weak nuclear force, there's a chance that a dark matter particle can interact with, say, an atom in your body, and produce a signal from that. But it's in your body, so you can't really tell. All right. So, so where where does this come into your your previous research? That's what I want to know. What were you doing in this field? Okay, so what we were doing was looking at a specific type of dark matter particle known as a weakly interacting massive particle. 
So just to break that down a bit, it's weakly interacting. So again, it interacts through the weak force and it's a massive particle. So we, unlike light, which is not massive, it doesn't have mass, uh, these do have some sort of mass to them. And so the acronym for this is WIMPs, because of course it is coming from physicists. But these WIMPs are what we're trying to detect, and they're currently one of the most likely candidates for dark matter. Now, for these particles, they can either be detected directly, so through those weak interactions, creating a signal of some sort that's then detected by a detector. They can also be detected through what are known as indirect detection. So that's where we say look at the amount of certain particles coming from the sun. And if we see more of them that theories can explain based on WIMPs, then that's also evidence for WIMPs. But a lot of the research being done right now is done with these direct detections. So what we're doing is we're setting up these detectors and waiting for a potential dark matter particle to come and interact with something inside of that detector or, or hit something inside of the detector. Well, what I don't really understand about um, dark matter is like, it sounds like it's everywhere, but like, why can't we just create it in a particle accelerator when you create interactions? Should there be dark matter coming out too? Are there part of matter that we see? Because it's not, well, think about it. Because our universe is so, if you believe in a Big Bang, right? Like it's created from one place. And if you have dark matter, we should have dark matter too in the particles we try to create. It shouldn't just be coming from, it shouldn't be just all cosmic. Yeah, but that's the problem, is that if you if you can't detect dark matter and you create it in a particle accelerator, how are you going to detect it? It's just going to do whatever. Uh, so that's something that's currently going on, especially with the Large Hadron Collider, where they aren't necessarily trying to directly detect a dark matter particle. So they aren't waiting for a dark matter particle to go through one of their detectors and leave a signal. Instead, what they're trying to do for the most part is look for the results of uh, a dark matter, say, decaying, or, or a dark matter particle that's colliding with another dark matter particle, and when they collide, they smash into each other and produce other resulting particles. So they aren't looking for direct detections of dark matter particles, but instead indirect detections, but they're still producing them within the accelerators. Yeah, that, that's another common thing in physics is kind of measuring something's existence through its effect. It's like black holes, right? You can't actually see them, but you can see the light they bend. You can see these kind of like quasars that come out of them. You can see they're kind of these big disks of gas that spin around them. Same thing for that. Yeah, well, I feel like a lot of people, when you think about indirect detection, they were like, whoa, how can you be sure? But when you think about it, a lot of things we do are technically indirect like when you see things you see the lights emitted you see the color black you're not seeing anything you you're observing the absence of light the absence of color basically right so in a way it's indirect but i think like we as humans have developed so many techniques to make sure basically by process elimination and to make and to make sure that that indirect signals can only be from that source we're trying to find. Exactly. Uh, another great example from particle physics, 10 years ago now, was the discovery of the Higgs boson. And we didn't actually directly detect the Higgs boson, but we detected its components. So when it decays, much like, say, uranium particle decays, kind of different, but when it decays, we detect those components and then we're able to trace them back and say oh this was a Higgs boson and that was a breakthrough discovery and the same with dark matter particles is we aren't actually directly detecting a dark matter particle we're detecting say its effects and we, we do call them direct detection experiments but in reality we aren't letting uh we, we aren't directly observing that weakly interacting mass of particle or whatever the dark matter particle is, we're recording its interaction with the detector and the response of that detector. Yeah, I think one of the more classic examples that people use for 
or indirect det- detection is uh, scintillators. Because if you think about scintillating, the word scintillate is basically create some form of signal. So instead of um, having certain particle going to de- detect it directly, the deter- detector itself has some material that once it interacts with such particle, it creates a detectable signal. And I think it's, it's, you have to be careful when you decide those systems, right? To make sure that all of those type of particles which create a signal in the range or frequency that you want. Yeah, uh, so you talked about scintillators, and that is definitely one of the methods for direct, uh, direct detection of dark matter, as well as other particles. Sin- uh, so scintillation is when you have some sort of high, higher energy particle interacting with some sort of material, and that material, usually a noble gas, when, when it's hit by that incoming particle, will vibrate, essentially, and give off some light. And that light can be used to say, oh, well, there must have been a particle right here, or else it wouldn't have given off light. Uh, this is m- how a lot of experiments work, whether it's giving off light, which is scintillation. Uh, there's also bubble chambers, which instead of reacting through electronic methods, so the electron moves and gives off light, or the nucleus moves and uh, creates light. Uh, instead, we have bubble chambers, which is based on thermal changes. So if a particle comes in and bumps some particles, they're kept at in a very particular state where they instantly evaporate. And there are other types of detectors as well. Yeah, these things also remind me not just you know the the more uh, more close to us, you know, particle detections are very out there, you know, <laughs> big collaboration. But if these kind of techniques can be even used, like you think about lasers, it's a similar um, techniques, right? You basically do stimulate em- that emission. So you put, you pump your material so that electrons at a higher energy and you want to stay there, well, they call it the population inversion. And what you want to do is that to, to basically send a, send a, a photon, a light in, and those high, uh, excited states would come back to ground state and create more and more light. That's why laser is so powerful. It's, it's, you know, it, it's so intense because you just keep pumping the material to higher states and you just send this little light in and just basically take all those energy out into one light. That's basically similar principles. And you can see a lot in, in physics, in science, where we basically the way to work around the magical inventions that people think. <laughs> um, during our undergrad, speaking of indirect, direct measurements, um, I, I believe you worked on a kind of a simple particle detector in a box where it creates those little shapes and patterns as particles whiz through it. I mean, I don't know how much time we have to talk about it, but if you want to. Uh, yeah, I will briefly touch on it then. Uh, so that's known as a cloud chamber or Wilson's cloud chamber. And so it's similar in principle to a bubble chamber. It, in fact, it came before the bubble chamber where essentially you have a layer of super cooled alcohol. And this alcohol is in such a state that if it changes temperature slightly, it will condense. So you have this kind of alcohol vapor, and so it's some sort of like poly... It's some sort of alcohol. And if a particle that's charged passes through it, it will interact with the alcohol molecules and cause them to condense. And so if you have a charged particle that's moving quite quickly, say just from background radiation, it will move through this vapor and it will condense, and you can actually see that as a white trail. I would highly recommend checking out videos of it. I also would like to point out that when you know scientists say alcohol, we don't mean the just what we drink or even methanol you put or ethanol, you know, or something you put in your wounds. Like in chemistry, alcohol just refer to any organic substance or material that have the OH group or the hydroxyl group at least one of them. And there can be many, many things that can be called alcohol in science, but you don't want to drink them because it will kill you. 
Yeah, uh, we. I will admit we did use ethanol, but it was a hundred percent ethanol, so that would uh, that would have quite the effect on you, it, and it's still kind of dangerous. Uh, so super cooled, <laughs> super yeah. cooled is um is a term for a metastable state of matter, where if you think of super cool liquid that you see, you probably have heard of when you can make your your pop, uh, kind of like a, a slushy. By putting in the fridge at certain, a uh, certain duration at certain temperature in the freezer, and you take it out, it's still liquid, and you tap it a bit, and it all froze into solid. So those, those are are called supercooled liquid. So when it's it's called metastable, it's like almost stable. But if you disturb it a bit, it because it wants to be solid. But if you cool it in a in a careful enough fashion, you can get away from solidifying or crystallizing the structure to create solids, so it remains liquid until you introduce a little touch, a little change to it, and it really runs back to being solid. Yeah, uh, and just for those interested, you can look up nucleation, which is why POP actually doesn't work for that, because there are too many nucleation sites. Yeah, Feely, Feely is over here saying he's not going to talk about his research today, and <laughs> I think he is a little bit, but that that's a story for another time. Um, I, I think we should get back to Patrick and why what what you did during your your masters, what kind of stuff you looked into on this. Yeah, so unlike bubble chambers, which rely on this nucleation and superheating or supercooling process, uh, I worked on ionization detectors so instead of producing bubbles or light what these detectors do is they per are held at a high voltage so there's a gas inside let's say a sphere because we work i worked with spheres and there's a gas that's filling that sphere and it's held at a very high voltage and so when you have a dark matter particle coming in and interacting with one of the gas atoms, then you will cause that gas atom to become ionized. And depending on the number of atoms that are ionized as the particle moves through the detector, they will release their electrons or some sort of ion, and it will drift in the way that the electric field directs it. Now, we use circular detectors because no matter where you are in the detector, you can have uh, a voltage source at the center and then just ground the outside of the de detector and the ions will drift towards the center of the detector. And then you can measure the changes in the electric field around the center of the de detector as more and more ions crowd closer together. And then from that change in electric field, you get a signal. And depending on the intensity of that signal, or the amplitude, or how long that signal lasts, will be indicative of the particle that passed through the detector. So it's a bit more complicated than just seeing a line of bubbles, uh, but it's also a very useful concept, not just for detecting dark matter, but really any type of particle that you're interested in. So. My direct involvement with these detectors was trying to eliminate the amount of other particles that were trying to come in and interact with the gas in these detectors. So that's something that a lot of areas of physics deal with is background noise from background radiation. And we want to try and minimize those background effects as much as possible. So. In the case of dark matter, it may happen so rarely that dark matter particle interacts with the detector that we don't want to have any other interactions going on just in case we miss that dark matter particle. So, so when you worked on this, it was experimental. So were you, were you in a lab hammering away at some piece of equipment? Were you, were you doing calculations? Were you running simulations? Were... I know a lot of these particle physics groups 
tend, they tend to work in these huge numbers. So you think of CERN, it's thousands and thousands of scientists from around the world kind of collaborating on one kind of, it's not one experiment, it's a bunch of experiments in kind of one big group. But what was your experience like there? Because I know as a theoretical physicist, my group is like four to eight people-ish, depending on the time of year. Yeah, so I did work in a collaboration, specifically the new experiments with spheres, gas, or the NewsG experiment. This is a lot smaller than CERN. It only has 40 to 60 collaborators. But you're absolutely right in saying that there's a whole bunch of different experiments going on at least to contribute to the main experiment. So my role was in a lab. Uh, to quote one of our, or to paraphrase one of our previous math professors, I was turning knobs and hitting buttons, but in a, in a much more advanced way than that. So I was responsible for working out system, a good system to remove radioactive impurities from the gas that's used in this detector. So in this case, uh, radon gas is pretty prevalent. If you're sitting in a basement right now or really in any building, chances are there's radon gas coming from your walls, your floors, your ceilings, everywhere. And that's just in the materials that are used for our building. And so this radon gas can also be found pretty much everywhere. And the issue is that it's radioactive and when it decays, it produces a really massive charged particle called an alpha particle. And this just wreaks havoc on the detector because it's so sensitive and so fine-tuned to detect these small, potentially small dark matter particles that if a very large, hefty charge particle comes in, it just messes with the detector completely. Alpha particle is just a glorified way to save a helium atom, basically, right? Exactly, yeah. Okay. So so this is a big problem with a lot of particle detectors. And so my work was to minimize the amount of radioactive gas that was present in the detector. And there were other teams working on eliminating radioactive materials from the materials of the detector itself. So it's a copper sphere. So removing uranium and thorium and all that from the copper sphere as well. Well, just to, to correct Liam a bit... Um... Is helium nucleus, not helium atoms. Uh, Alpha particles don't have electrons. Well, and also it looks like we got to um, run now to the last part. Thank you, Patrick, for talking about the stuff about dark matter and dark energy. But he will talk more because today we're going to talk about, for the story, about the very, very famous and prominent, very important sci scientist, Lord Kelvin. We all have heard Lord Kelvin at some point in your life because we all use Celsius, some people use Fahrenheit, but a lot of scientists, we use Kelvin. And this is a story of the man, the myth, the legend, Lord, the actual, actually, he's a Baron, Baron Kelvin. Patrick, take it away. Yes, but before we get into the story of Lord Kelvin... I will just let you know how you can contact us if you have any questions or topic suggestions, or just to let us know if we're doing a good or terrible job. So you can find us on Instagram at The Hyperthesis, uh, or you can send us an email at hyperthesispodcast at gmail.com. We're currently on Apple Music, Google Play Podcast, as well as Spotify, and we're based on at anchor.fm slash hyperthesis. So you can find us in many locations wherever you get your podcast it's actually apple podcast you can't search in apple music i tried oh. <laughs> <laughs> that is excellent to know so yeah feel free to reach out to us and send us an email um and we're more than happy to hear from you so going back to the story of lord kelvin who is baron kelvin as some of us recently discovered so lord kelvin was originally born as william thompson in 19, or 1824. He's originally from Belfast, which is in Northern Ireland, so part of the United Kingdom. But he moved to Glasgow, um, where his father was appointed the chair of mathematics at the university in Glasgow. So this was around 1830. Thompson was around six years old. His mother had just died. 
And he had a father as a math professor. So at the age of 10, Kelvin, or William Thompson, enrolled at the university as its youngest ever student. So imagine at the age of 10 years old, going to university. Now, of course, the university was equipped to, for elementary teaching, so it wasn't like he was learning advanced university concepts, but it's still pretty neat to say that you were at university at the age of 10. Now, at the same time, moving later on, and just a bit of spoilers later in his life, he was also the oldest u- university student that was ever enrolled, because after he retired at the age of 75, he immediately re-registered as a student. So, you'll, he has quite the history in Glasgow, and you'll see that many, many things are named after him. So there's places like Kelvin Cycle, Kelvin Dale, Kelvin Grove. So he was certainly a famous man, but how did he get there in the first place? So after starting at the University of Glasgow at the age of 10, he showed an aptitude for academics. So again, being in, having great influences such as his father and being surrounded by academics, he definitely had an aptitude for academics and even sports. So for those of you who like sports and academics, there is hope for you. Absolutely. A little bit of error at him because um, things were named after him. He was named after the River Kelvin that curls around the foot of the University of Glasgow. And a lot of plays were named Kelvin. And he actually got the title you know, when he got a noble to be a, a, a lord and baron. And he, they gave the name Kelvin to him. Yeah, so Kelvin is an actual place that you can visit, but uh, better known for the person. And so his aptitude for both mathematics and physics and his interest in the sciences introduced him to people like Fourier and Newton before him, who had proposed these incredible theories. And during his time at the University of Glasgow, as well as going to Cambridge University, he started publishing already. So from a ripe young age of just a young adult, he published under the pseudonym PQR and published several papers in the fields of physics and mathematics, talking about different theory, theories, especially from Fourier and whatnot. And at the age of 22, he became a professor. Now, for any of you who are undergraduates currently, and I would say average, you'll probably graduate at 2022. I I know a lot of us did. And so imagine becoming a professor right after you graduate from your BSc or your bachelor degree. And all these super geniuses make you feel real bad about not having been published 20 times and having tenure at the age of 23, 24. It's rough. Yeah, it's a little bit heartbreaking, but I guess times have changed. Uh, so during his 53 years of tenure as a professor, Kelvin introduced many revolutionary ideas. Not all of them were correct, but there were a lot of things that he did get right and that we're still building on to this day. Some of these ideas include the idea that there's an absolute zero temperature. So as Feely mentioned earlier, science uses a scale named after Kelvin for temperature, and that is the Kelvin scale. And that's based on the fact that Kelvin proposed that there's such a temperature that in which atoms stop moving. So atoms inherently vibrate. And so if you get colder and colder, those vibrations slow down. And at something known as absolute zero, he proposed that atoms will stop moving. Now, Later, theories in quantum mechanics and everything said, oh, we can't actually reach absolute zero, but we can get pretty darn close based on experiments. But this idea of absolute zero uh, was proposed by him, and it's at negative 273.15 degrees Celsius, and that's still in use to this day. I think even if you could reach absolute zero, you, you'd still have movement due to quantum mechanics. But and anyway, I won't. We can continue. Exactly, yeah. 
So uh, among these ideas, he also contributed to the field of dark matter, and in fact was one of the first such people to do so. If you remember ta- me talking earlier, uh, we mentioned that the first theories involved dim stars or dark planets or dark stars, and so Kelvin was one of the first people to actually make these observations and propose that, hey, there's actually more mass than what we can see up in the heavens. And so this idea later led on to the idea of machos, which are massive astronomical compact halo objects, which are a proposed type of dark matter that was taken seriously for quite a long time. They're kind of falling out of favor, but it's interesting to know that Kelvin made that theory and and these observations well over 100 years ago. He also made many other contributions to science. He was a very broad and far-reaching scientist, so he helped develop the transatlantic cable uh, by doing data loss calculations and figuring out the best method to prevent data loss. And so that's one of the reasons we were able to communicate across the Atlantic in a very fast and efficient manner. Uh, He also made many other contributions, and many of his different works are still being built on today. There are still theories of his that are relevant and being researched. Now, there are a couple of things that he did get wrong that I mentioned earlier. Uh, One is that he didn't actually believe in the theories of x-rays, thinking that they were a hoax when they were first met by Röntgen. Now, we know that today x-rays definitely exist, but given the time, it's still good to question these science results that are coming out and, and to wait for further research to come out. And he also had some theories about the aether, which we mentioned earlier, and how atoms were atomic, like some sort of vortices within the aether, which, again, is not completely far off our current theories about different field theories, but again, it's okay to be wrong in science. And throughout Calvin's life, he made many different accomplishments and uh, died at the age of 83 in Largs, Scotland, and he currently rests today next to Isaac Newton at Westminster Abbey in London. So if we are to look for one thing to remember Calvin by, scientists might pick different things. They might pick the absolute temperature scale as his crowning achievement. And other people might say, oh, well, he did really great work in other areas of thermodynamics. Or people in communications might say the telegraph and the transatlantic cable were his most accomplished achievements. No matter how you look at it, he definitely was a great man and led led us to think about a lot of things. You already know what I'm about to say, but I remember him for Kelvin ship wakes, which is the pattern that a ship leaves behind as it goes through the ocean. Because those are caustics. <laughs> but enough about that. Well, to end this with, I would go for the Alexander Russell's eulogy that he, for uh, Lord Kelvin, he said, his work lives and will continue to live. And to actually end this story, (laughs) I put on the quote from Baron Kelvin himself. And he said, When you are face to face with a difficulty, you are up against a discovery. And on that note, thank you for listening. And we'll see you next week. Bye, everyone. See ya.